Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here for our 25th summer celebration. It's great to look out in the audience and see so many friends and supporters of the Aspen Institute, including our board chair, Jim Crown, his wife, Paula, many other trustees and members of our Society of Fellows, members of the Aspen Strategy Group, members of the Aspen Community, uh, former Aspen Institute president, president, CEO, legendary Walter Isaacson is here tonight. Thank you, Walter, for being here. We are delighted this evening to celebrate and hear from this year's recipient of the Aspen Institute's Corporate Leadership Award, Jamie Diamond, Chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Congratulations, Jamie. Thank you. Jamie and J.P. Morgan are known across the globe as leaders in the financial world for the depth of their social impact and the seriousness with which they commit to corporate engagement, corporate social responsibility. We are so pleased to recognize his lifetime of work supporting fair economic practices, uh, progressive future-oriented thinking, investment in people and communities, and all around improving the human condition. Jamie will be in conversation this evening with a great journalist, Jillian Tett, U.S. Managing Editor for the Financial Times. Real news. I love when they clap for the interviewer as well as the interviewee. Um, and this That's one, of course, is, uh, is the author of three books, um, the, the Silo Effect, Saving the Sun, and her serious uh, coverage of the 2008 financial crisis, Fool's Gold. Jillian, thank you for being here. Welcome. Well, thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction. And I should say that you are in for a treat tonight. I've been looking forward to this for several weeks because not only are we sitting here with a very well-informed, highly engaged audience, but we have a chance to put under the spotlight somebody who is truly a luminary of the modern financial system and, dare I say it, the American political economy. Because, Jamie Dimon, you've now been in the spotlight for two decades, more than that, actually. Um, under your leadership, um, the share price of J.P. Morgan has tripled since the crisis, doubled since you started. But what's particularly striking is that as of this October, when Lloyd Blankfein, your friend and rival, um, retires, you will be the only person on the sell side from the financial crisis era who is still in place. <laughs> still kicking. <laughs> shall we, con shall we con congratulate you or commiserate you? I don't know. And if the recent announcement from J.B. Morgan is correct, I think you're going to be there for another five years. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That's what we said, yeah. Okay. If you're not tempted by public service or going off to be president or anything like that beforehand. <laughs> okay, this is officially one of the few times when Jamie Dimon does not have a quick comment back. I, I love my job and I intend to stay there. Well, you've had a stellar run, quite stellar run. And aside from the remarkable time at J.P. Morgan, and you've just had your record second quarter earnings, you've also been an outspoken force in the business community, chairing the business round table. And one of the few CEOs has spoken out quite forcefully on issues like immigration, income inequality, and the state of the American political economy today. So we have a lot to talk about to do with, to do with corporate leadership, which is what you're getting your award for tonight. We have a lot to talk about in terms of where America is, where the American economy is, where the risks to the financial system are today, what lessons we can learn from the financial crisis. But I'd like to start by asking you about something else, which is a bus tour. Because Jamie Dimon has just been on a bus tour. Yes, an actual bus tour. Not an airplane tour dressed up as a bus, an actual bus tour <laughs> across the west of America. Tell us a bit about it and what you've done, and tell us whether this is your version of Mark Zuckerberg's listening tour. Yeah, so welcome, thrilled to be here, folks. Thank you for having me here, and um, 
So every, we've, this is our 10th bus tour, and we started, you know, you always get out on the road, and you fly around, you go to major cities, but after we bought WAMA, which is literally 10 years ago, uh, we decided to go a little off the beaten path and take a bus, and we wear jeans and polo shirt, no matter what we do, we see CEOs. And we as the senior I, management I, the, the, JP Some Morgan. of the management team, and we, we swap during the way, and, uh, and we do big client events like this, literally dinners for hundreds of people, for CEOs, and I went to Palm Beach, I told them it was for jeans and stuff like that. I was the only one in the room wearing jeans. And uh, anyway, uh, we go to call centers, op centers. We've got barbecues, appreciation events, uh, uh, town halls. We had a lot of give and take. But part of the point is also in between the bus ride. You know, on, on the bus ride, we also have tellers, loan officers, branch managers, private uh, client advisors, et cetera. We give them beer and immunity when they get on the bus. <laughs> and we say, just lay it on us. And just tell us what we could do better, what we do wrong. And I also get to see my own management, like how they react to this stupid stuff that all these companies do, you know, how we fix it. And we literally get on the phone and fix someone on the spot. Other things take a little bit of stuff. We report right. back to everybody what we fix, what we know, what we learn, and stuff like that. We have a lot of fun. We leave a little time to do hiking. Uh, I was on Aspen, one of them, by the way, and then Vail, one of them, and Jackson Hole, one of them. And, and we, you know, this time we, we actually flew to Las Vegas, flew to uh, uh, San Diego, and then went all the way up the coast of Santa Barbara, and then we flew to Seattle. Right. So we went back to the 10th anniversary of Wamu. Right, so we are officially part of the bus tour. We're all part of Jamie Diamond's bus yeah. tour <laughs> right now. But the point of doing this is really to go out and really listen to the soul of America and listen to the soul of your company. And since we have many people in the room who have previously run companies, yeah. it's an idea which probably resonates with many people here. But I'm curious, so you've done this bus tour, what do you think the current state of America is? So anyone who runs a company, if you don't go see your call centers, your op centers, your plans, stuff like that, you can't possibly know what's going on. You can't run a company like from the corporate heirs, you know, like somehow you're just dictating down below. So you have to do something like that's part of what you do to, to run a company. So can I, so uh, America, let me just can I give you the big picture, the long-term picture, and then the more short one. The big one, this nation is in extraordinary good shape. We have all the food, water, and energy we need, the Atlantic and the Pacific, the wonderful neighbors in Canada and Mexico, and these things were given to us by God. Then we have the things that were given to us by the Enlightenment and our founding fathers, you know, which is uh, a free enterprise, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. If you're a Democrat, repeat, freedom of enterprise. Freedom <laughs> of enterprise. Uh, but those things led to the most dynamic and prosperous economy the world's ever seen. The widest and deepest and most transparent financial markets, universities, schools, it grew unbelievable innovation. And if you made a, a very low corruption, very strong rule of law, though that's getting weaker these days too, and if you made that list and go around the world, Turkey, Brazil, China, Russia, India, they don't have that. They, they, would, break, they would give an arm and a leg to have that kind of stuff. So in, in, all, now in the shorter run, the economy is booming. I mean, it is absolutely booming, and you see it almost everywhere, and there are no major potholes out there. I mean, you can talk about geopolitics, and we'll talk, there are two risks, uh, which we'll talk about later, because I know they're on your list. Um, but, you know, wages, are, uh, people coming back to the workforce, houses in short supply, which is a plus for the economy, uh, credit that's on the balance sheet of financial institutions is pristine, uh, uh, companies have plenty of money, you've got tax reform, which is going to help the, re the retention and reinvestment of capital in the United States of America. You have all these wonderful things happening. It's just, we can't believe it. It's been nine years or 10 years. But to put it in context, is 20% growth in a nine year period. It should have been 40%. It should have been 40%, the average growth in seven or eight, in seven or eight years. So we have this long list of problems, which we're gonna, I, I mentioned real quick. Uncompetitive taxes business, which has been fixed. Infrastructure, we put a man on the moon in eight years. We can't f fix a bridge in 12 years now. Okay, inner city schools simply don't work, and we're relegating generations of minorities and poor kids to, to poverty. Uh, uh, the litigation system is becoming increasingly capricious, and regulation, I'm not going to say about regulation, when companies say regulation, they always think we're trying to go up the hook. Bureaucracy. Like, I, this listening tour, you should go with me and listen to small business, middle market, large corporations talk about paperwork, bureaucracy, and it's sinecure. It's a form of corruption that's seeped into the American right. system to keep jobs out there, and you see it all over the place. And, Small business formation, because of that, and I'm not sure of this one, I can't quite prove it, is less than it's ever been in a major American recovery. Okay, and that's a lot of jobs. And so there are all these problems we have that are by almost right. all self-inflicted. I mean, I just mentioned a whole bunch, all self-inflicted. And, and immigra even immigration, if we had proper immigration reform, it would help us grow 0.2% a year. Right. We send 300,000 kids a year to get, get degrees here back home. 
And they, you know, our American universities brag about it, like what a good job they're doing exporting. You know, they brag as to $50 billion of exports to American universities because foreign nationals pay the full boat. So basically, we're exporting brains. Right. I mean, how dumb can you possibly be? And we, so one after another, we've, we've really dumbed down policy in this country. Well, let's, let's tease and, some And those issues. things have led to a lot of the populism that you're going to refer to later. I am going to, you're going to talk about populism in a minute. But before we do, let's turn back and start about the economy. Because yes, the economy is booming. <coughs> yes, we've had a remarkable nine-year run. But, and yes, you keep saying that there aren't big potholes out there. And yet, what keeps you awake at night? What are the risks you see that could actually derail this? Well, I'm not going to talk about geopolitics because in reality... Please do. Well, let me know. I'm going to skip it for a second. Because in reality, and we've, one of our economists did a great thing. They took all the geopolitical uh, problems since World War II. She had Vietnam, Korea, multiple wars in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, uh, six, six or seven crises in the Middle East. Afghanistan and, uh, I mean, Pakistan and India had a war. China and Vietnam had a war. China and Russia had border skirmishes. You can go all around the world. Only one affected the global economy in the short run. The other ones had huge effect, like Vietnam, which was still, is still affecting us. But if you say, what did affect the economy in your one two year period? It was, and the only one was the 73 million crisis. So anytime you open the paper, it'll scare the hell out of you. Okay? And you can take any week of any month of any year. And so I just want to put that aside. Trade. So right now, all that's happened in trade is. is that's, that's risk number one, is it? Risk number one. We, we've put tariffs in 50 billion. The immediate economic effect of that is nil. Doesn't really mean much. But, but it starts to affect confidence a little bit, investment a little bit. You've seen confidence come down. You know, business confidence and consumer confidence went to all time highs after Trump was elected. Um, but if the next round would be far more severe, and there will be tit for tat, we've told the president will be tit for tat. We have told them that, you, that while you've pointed out very legitimate concerns about China, and they are legitimate about state owned enterprises, IP stealing, in, uh, we don't have reciprocal investment uh, arrangements, et cetera. The way to fix it was to get Canada and Mexico, Japan and Europe, our allies, have a common front, and tell the Chinese this is the way we want to do trade, set up rules and guidelines, and stuff like that. Instead, we're having a war with China, Mexico, I mean, with, with Mexico, India, uh, 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 Mexico, Canada, Japan, Europe, and China. And China will do tit for tat. We've told them that. So, you know, a lot of people say it won't happen, but they've already been wrong. We've already said that the president's advisors have already given them very bad advice. So, if, if it gets much worse, that is one of those situations which can start to. And how much worse does it have to get? Because we've already seen just in the last 24 hours, um, you know, an escalation from China's side. But this is I mean, are we on the edge now? We, 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 we all know that. They will be measured tit for tat. That's what they're going to do. So will Europe. So will Japan. That is completely predictable. And of course, that's already kind of in the market. It's the execution, when they actually execute barriers, that you, I think you'll have people saying they didn't expect that, that they, some of you worked. Now, they say they're very close to Mexico and, I mean, getting a deal in Mexico. And what we're fighting for in Mexico is absurd. Okay? I personally think that we've asked Mexico and Canada a bunch of stuff to do, which is no one wants, not, not, not Canadians, not Mexicans. I won't bore you with the details about these sunset provisions, arbitration clauses, but w they're fine. And, we're, and for some reason, our guys want to make them worse. And uh, China is the big enchilada. China is a real issue. And the business community, the BRT, me, all of us, went to see the president. And Obama used to say to the business community, you don't support me when I talk about China. You support me privately, but not publicly. Because most CEOs, and I, I spoke myself to Wang Shishan and Minister Liu, that don't believe it when a CEO walks in and says, it's great, you're wonderful, we love doing business here, thank you very much, because we, we want to be there. But then we all go back and tell the American presidents that it's grossly unfair and that they, they need to react to it. And I think they will eventually, by the way. But you know, they're, right now, I don't, who's negotiating it? Well, you think the, the, White, the, you think the White House them, will listen to you? What? You think the White House? No, they House? have not. They've completely ignored But do you think they will listen to you? They've not listened to they, you yet. They've they backed off a little bit. They want to get NAFTA done. They did a little bit with Europe. And you see the rumors that Mnuchin's starting to talk to uh, China again. So maybe they're saying, no, well, let's go back to the, the tried and true and uh, but his advisors are quite serious about, you know, uh, hey, they've, I walked into the Oval Office and the president said, hey, here comes the global elite. And uh, uh, they're quite serious that, you know, you, we've tried for 15 years and nothing worked. I'm going to get tough. So I think there's a, a rather good chance that they put in that $200 billion. And then the Chinese will do their 50. And then you'll start to see market reactions, confidence come down, growth slow right. down. And that'll, if you're in business, that'll confuse all your supply chains. You can't possibly understand 
the depth of that, when they start putting tariffs on 5,000 products, exactly how, but you, it'll start wearing its ugly head, and you see it a little bit today. Well, we had a calculation on the FT where we worked out that just in the steel sector alone, there's already been 16,000 applications for exemptions by American companies. And if you stop for a moment and think about the bureaucracy that entails and what that means to supply chains, it's absolutely mind-blogging. Yeah. Just in the last few weeks, 16,000. Quite, you know, astonishing. It's but so that's, so that's risk number one. That's only risk number one. What about risk number two? Right, tell us, tell us about the second about, issue which keeps about you... About two more. But, uh, okay, the second risk. one is we're reversing QE. Let me just give you some big numbers, okay? QE is, was $12 trillion by the, all the major central banks, $4 trillion in the United States. So this is, they go and they buy tr basically treasuries, and, and in Europe they're buying literally 20, 30% of corporate bond issues. So this is a huge uh, liquidity into the system that suppressed rates, and maybe it helped the economy recovery, and I think QE1 did in QE2. My guess is QE3 was more like pushing on a string. And they're reversing it. Now as long as they're reversing it for good reason, so people say rates are going up, always ask yourself why. The why is often more important than the what. If rates are going up and we have a strong economy, we're fine. There are a lot of examples of rates are going up, even mortgage rates are going up, housing is strong, people going back to the workforce, because the strong economy dwarfs, I used to say trumps, the strong economy dwarfs. <laughs> uh, Phil dwarfs, Peter said. <laughs> yeah, it dwarfs the other effects. But, but if you're sitting here a year from now, and I'm going to list a bunch of stuff that could work against us, and inflation has reared its ugly head, and I actually think the chances that are higher than most other people. Okay, and you know, wait, we're going to have un global unemployment hit the lowest it's ever been this year. Global. The United States may very well hit a post-war global low sometime this year. The commodity cycle's changed, wages are going up, minimum wages are going up. I, I, we're at this strip, everyone's complained, I can't find workers, it's too expensive. I say, well, that's what you all wanted. That's what we wanted, people back to work. Now we have to compete for, for people, and so share some of the wealth with the, you know, with the people now, and so, but, Put that in the midst that we don't know exactly what QE did, therefore you can't possibly know what the reversal QE is going to do. And you don't know, right now we've been telling you, the Federal Reserve has been telling you kind of, don't worry, it'll be very gentle, this won't hurt at all, you won't even feel it. <laughs> yeah, but the Federal Reserve doesn't control everything. And so, you know, if, rates, if inflation is going up and they've got to move quicker, and then they're doing it with a whole other change of monetary rules. So think of the rules that banks live under, market-making rules, highly leveraged governments, not companies, governments. Uh, and uh, and you, I don't want to bore you with monetary policy, but in the old days, you say you have an excess reserve. There's a deposit in the bank. You can lend it out. Now there's almost three trillion of excess reserves. It can't be lent out because of new uh, uh, regulatory requirements. So people always say, why are you lending out your excess? We have 500 billion sitting in the Fed. I can't lend out under any circumstances. And it'll sit there forever and for the rest of our lives. So the mechanic uh, and, and so and I'm, not, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have liquidity. I'm just saying that we don't really know what that does. So the, the, ba the bad case, and I'm not saying this is a high probability, but I wouldn't, you know, if you're planning, there's a case that rates are not 4%. I think rates should be 4% today, but that they are at 5 or 5.5, and, and the short end goes to 4. And So if I were you, I'd plan, you know, you better be prepared to deal with that stuff with higher inflation, and obviously the worst thing is stagflation. But if the monetary stuff causes any, a panic like we had in 09, where every one of you, because everyone in this thing all panicked, they all got scared, every investment committee, you sold your credit, you sold this, get out, there's the depression. That is what causes the problem. And so if this somehow elicits that kind of reaction in the market, that's the bad outcome. So what you're basically saying is that... JP Morgan will be fine, by the way. Just <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to scare I'm you. I'm going to come back and let you say your piece on JP Morgan in a minute. Yeah. But before we do, for the crowd here who want to know what they're going to do with their investments, Okay, so you think that interest rates could go easily way above 4%, 5 6 7%. You think that inflation is a much higher risk. I'm, I'm, giving, I'm not saying it's going to. I'm saying there's a, no, there's, it could. There's a I said higher could. Po po probability than most people think. That's what I'm saying. Right. Okay, you're going to get their attention at that point. Right. Um, do you think that the financial system is robust enough today to cope with a sudden interest rate shock or a panic? Because, you know, there have been some big changes post-2008 in terms of the trading environment, and we don't want to get too technical for this crowd, but, you know, it, things have changed in terms of how assets are actually traded, aren't they? The potential for so-called narrow exits right. has risen a lot. And ETFs and all these other things that might have a play in that. Yeah, so the, the system has literally two and a half times capital, two and a half times liquidity, so it's not, it won't be a banking issue. Okay, that, and, and for a lot of banks, it wasn't an issue last time either, but... 
But there can easily be a market issue, and banks will not be able to intermediate like they did. And of course, the federal, if they were standing, they'd say, well, if that happens, we'll change these rules and requirements. I, I think most banks are going to tell them, yeah, well, not, not anymore. Because last time it happened, they were, we were very badly treated by all these folks. And so, yes, the, the, and I, and I, Sorry, think, I, I want to give you a think, le Lehman Redux. Take Lehman, OK? When Lehman went bankrupt, and you could argue whether it should have been allowed to or not, they had 20, I think these numbers are roughly accurate, 20 billion of equity. They had a $20 billion mark-to-mark -mark loss in their, some of their mostly commercial real estate and mortgage-related type stuff. They had $80 billion of debt, and they were not very liquid. The new rules, they would have had 50 or 60 billion of equity. They'd have $120 billion of debt, bailable debt, and they would have had two times liquidity. They would not have failed under the new regime. So I think the regulators should take a little bit of a, of a victory lap and say, and, and by they can take it over legally, which they couldn't do in the crisis, and they have the wherewithal and the transparency to have an orderly unwind. What happened with Lehman, it was, it was unorderly. So Wamu and Bear Stearns were orderly because we did it. They would have been disorderly if, if we didn't do it, but Lehman was disorderly. The money got caught up all over the world. People were suing each other. People didn't know where their, where their collateral was. They couldn't sell their securities. The, you know, the government started to fight with each other about trying to lock up funds in their own countries. And it would be orderly this time. So that is a great thing. So the financial system is far sounder. There are a lot of things that they did that were uncoordinated and wrong and may cause these other problems. But yeah, the system is much sounder. So the problem, but someone will get hurt. And if the market, if you all walk in, when you all, how many of you have served on like investment committees? When you serve an investment committee and the market goes down and you walk in and say, what is countrywide repo again? <laughs> What's, why do we have Lehman commercial paper? What is this thing out there? You sell it. And, and who is going to step in? And fundamentally, the people who stepped in I mean, last who's time. Who's going to step in and buy stuff? The people who stepped maker. in last time were the big banks who were still strong, not all of them, they were not all strong, and the government, the, the Federal Reserve. And, and some argue, you know, right. I know you had Paulson and Geithner here recently, that the Federal Reserve actually had their, some of their authorities constrained by Dodd-Frank. And I think that is a little bit true. So the issue basically is that if we do have a jump up in interest rates, if we have a surge in inflation, and if, if investors panic and try and sell in a hurry, there will be no one there to buy, which is a pretty, you know, nerve-wracking thought. And it's like, here's like some stupid rules, okay? Okay. So, so in the last crisis, J.P. Morgan rolled over, to, and to include a lot of people, we rolled over all your loans. Every year, a trillion and a half dollars of loans, both credit card, home equity, more corporate, at the same rate. Now, the market was charging four times that. Okay? In this crisis, because of some of these new rules, we will have to actually reduce some of that in the crisis. And that's the problem. Yeah, Do that, you, that's, not, that's not the way you should have set up the system. Can I just ask, since you know, we, are, we are now 10 years after the financial crisis, do you regret having bought Bear? Yes. I mean, you know, Bear, look, I, I hate saying it because we've got some wonderful people and we've got a prime brokerage business we didn't have. And so I don't, I hate to say it that way, but, you know, we, and we paid a, a, a little over a billion dollars for a company that had a market cap of 20 and book equity of 12. But, and we wrote off almost all of that in what they call purchase accounting for litigation, for close down, for stock lawsuits, for de-risking the balance sheet. We had to basically de-risk or hedge $200 billion of assets. And so, uh, and it was a huge amount of work. Our people worked around the clock to consolidate, if you haven't even been in an investment bank and trading, to consolidate systems, you know, liquidate stuff. Uh, and then the government comes around a couple years later and they decide to punish us over it. So. And you think that was unfair? I know it was unfair. <laughs> And I don't trust, I will not trust, I'm not going to trust any government ever completely again, okay? Governments can do whatever they want. The Constitution doesn't matter, nothing matters. When, when people get mad, you know, the, 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 these governments will just pretty much do what they want. And okay? do you think it was a mistake to let Lehman Brothers collapse? My view is, there is a law, okay? And, I, and they, the law is that the Federal Reserve can lend money to a solvent company. Okay, and against assets to a solvent company. And that is the law. And Lehman was insolvent. Like their assets were not equal to their liabilities. At that point, that was our best guess at the time. Now, of course, the government did a lot of things that weren't quite legal back then, so they probably could have stepped in anyway and come up with another law or something like that. But my view is whether they did or didn't, that the crisis would have unfolded anyway. It just would have taken a different, slightly different path. There were, there, what happened in Lehman is we, we were telling the world that there was a trillion dollars of bad assets in the financial system. And it was everywhere. It was all mortgages, by the way. It was everywhere. And derivatives were a teeny part of it, but derivatives helped pass it on to other players and things like that. So 
Like I thought when Lehman, when Lehman collapsed, you know, when Lehman went down that weekend and stuff like that, uh, or even Bear, you know, immediate, there was immediate, the markets got kind of happy for a moment, and then they realized what it meant. And then you started to have a collapse, which is what we knew was going to happen, is that you're telling the world what in God's name is going on here, and it was pretty bad. So how did J.P. Morgan survive better than others? Well, we were going into, you know, you, I always tell people you can't have a, uh, I, I always, I've always looked at, and anything we do is what's the worst case. I'm not saying they're going to happen. But like we do a China worst case, which is China going off the map. Not, you know, markets go bad. We, you know, we, we, we prepare for wars and we prepare for, when I got to J.P. Morgan Chase, they used to stress test, uh, and, the, and you, any, every business do this. You used to stress test every input and every output price you have to understand what these things do to you. But they said, worst case is the stock market going down 10%, uh, uh, currencies moving 3%, uh, emerging markets moving what, credit spreads gapping out 40%. I said, no, 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 worst case, equities down 50%. Okay, worst case uh, uh, credit, so instead of interest spreads going from 120 over treasuries, I said not that 40% is you know, not very much, is to worst case ever, and high yield to worst case ever, which was 17%, it hit 20% of the crisis. So immediately, and, we, and then we had more capital, more liquidity. We had absolutely zero, virtually zero unsecured wholesale funding. So a lot of banks, particularly in Europe, were borrowing, they would simply go borrow from other banks, they borrow commercial paper, they borrow what they call euro dollar deposits, this is uncollateralized money, so it's not like repo. It's uncollateralized money that the other side just simply have to roll over. And we had zero. Some of these other banks, it was 30% of their balance sheet. Right. And some of the investment banks, it was you know, a big chunk of their balance sheet. And we had zero. The chance of having a run in J.P. Morgan was basically zero. And so one thing you can't stress test for. And the other thing is, you, the other thing that some of these things don't get is, you gotta run a good profitable company. So that when profits are, you know, this is like business 101. Corporate strategy 101. If I'm earning a 20% margin and you're earning 10, you're going to go bankrupt first. Okay? <laughs> That's like, and our margins, we got them, finally got them up better to everybody else. So when, you know, we never lost money. The stress test, to show you how severe the stress tests are, the stress test has had us losing $30 billion in nine quarters after Lehman type event. In the nine quarters after Lehman, we made $30 billion and we never lost money in a quarter. That's why I call it a fortress balance sheet. We were the rock of Gibraltar, and that would happen today. The, 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 the events that would make us lose money, you know, by, I would worry about something like cyber, but the events in the markets are oh, very little. Okay, well, one thing you can't stress test for, even with a fortress balance sheet, is a world of rising populism, yeah. of capricious governments, of nationalism, of unpredictable um, political reactions, or a world where, frankly, you walk into the White House, you collectively, and as you just said earlier, the president turns around and says, here comes the globalized elite, mm -hmm. or the president's advisor. That's a pretty unpredictable world that you would not have expected 10 years ago. So I guess my question really is, first of all, how high or how much higher do you think populism can go? Because I wrote, a, in fact, a column that's up on the FT website right now, this morning, um, looking at some of Ray Dalio, Bridgewater's populist um, analyses, you know, 35% of the Western electorate voted for populist candidates in 2017, up from 5% at the start of the decade. Mm. Um, I've sat around with people and talked about this recently um, on Wall Street and in Washington, and the consensus is that populism could get even higher quite soon. I know it's been a key theme of the Aspen Security Forum in the recent days and was discussed yesterday. How bad do you think populism could get? Mm -hmm. And how on earth does a big bank that is a very easy target protect itself against being seen as the globalized elite, which is a favorite so, pinata. So I'm going to say the third major risk is I'm going to call bad policy. Okay, so that's and, your third big risk. And so populism, and you have to ask what is populism because it's different things to different people and different sides. Yeah, it'll probably get worse. And you know, public policy has gotten worse and the, the divisions have gotten worse. And, you know, and, I, and there are all these, the fact is people are living better than ever before. But it's literally around the world and in the United States. But, and we've done a lot of work, the middle class incomes did not go up for 15 years. They live better, by the way, so even though it's $55,000, but they live better. They live longer, medicine's better, air conditioning's better, cars are safer and stuff like that. But the worst part was low wage incomes have not kept up with the living wage. So you go back 30 or 40 years ago, unskilled, get a job in a factory, and eventually kind of be earning a living wage of a house and a car. And that's probably untrue today. 
Uh, and then, then there's this other part of society, and I think one of the mistakes we all make, I'm, I'm going to blame all of us, by the way. When the public blames the elite, we had the financial crisis, and this part of the population is left behind, and that part of the population we don't even see. We don't have to worry about it. We don't go to the schools. We don't visit our children in prisons. You know, we don't have all these things. We kind of bypass all that. So, and, and in some ways, so the elite, and I'm talking about union heads, CEOs, politicians, kind of generally to blame, that we didn't work together to fix some of these problems. And you know, we talk about them, but we've done a terrible job. And, uh, and that populism is, sees two things. One is they see a lot of us living really well, and that they aren't, or they're maybe getting worse. And they also see the government in, is incompetent. You know, so it isn't, it isn't that simple. They wanted someone like Donald Trump because they didn't want to punch the elite in the nose, and they know that government doesn't work. Government wasn't the solution. Of course, the Democrats think that government's the solution to everything. And you know, that doesn't work either, so. So do you consider yourself a Republican or Democrat today? I, I don't really care anymore. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 urge, I urge people, I think this knee-jerk reaction of Democrats and Republicans is terrible. You know, if you're a Democrat, you should read some of the great writers on the conservative side, like George Will and Arthur Brooks and David Brooks. And if you want to, you know, if you're a Republican, you should read Tom Friedman and, and maybe there are a couple of smart Democrats out there. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think we, we, we've lost the plot about what works and what doesn't work. We've lost collaboration. We've lost all the things that are really important. And, and if we don't get back to it, this, it will get worse. So OK, so one of the things you said interestingly recently is that. But, and I think the press has to help. So, you know, okay, well, if in doubt, no, blame the press. That's the one thing everyone on both sides appears to unite on right no, now. No, but, I, but I'm, I'm making a different point. I'm not, as you know, I always talk to the press. I've never blamed the press for anything. They're a reflection of us. Just so are the politicians. We voted. So I blame the people for both sides. But very often, we don't put things in context. We don't, and I'm going to give you an ex a specific example, and we don't educate. You know, you've got to educate. Part of the, part of the press is to educate. And, and, and you know, saying, here's your opinion, here's your opinion, is not education. Let's just stay in two people's opinions, stuff like that. And so, uh, <laughs> like, I don't say this to Bernie Sanders because I don't want to help his image in any way, shape, or form. But when he gets up there and says, we should share the wealth, medical for everyone, pensions for everyone, education for everyone, well, what the hell does J.P. Morgan Chase do? Tell what, us. What do all the big institutions do? They're at the forefront of that. We pay our people well, we share the wealth, we spend a billion dollars here in educating our own people, we move them around the world, we help them when they fall down, we give them full medical, full dental, full, hell, we give them Pilates, massages, and <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever makes them feel good. And so these wonderful institutions have been, have just are constantly being kicked. Every little thing they do wrong, like they're bad, and, it, and trust in the system drops all the time. And, and it's not just us, by the way. So, you know, they, we've done it to the police. We've done it to them, sometimes to the military, and they make mistakes. We've done it to politicians. But there's constantly b beating people for, you know, I'm going to say sometimes big mistakes, sometimes little mistakes, and stuff like that. But, but we've got to educate people. Well, and so, any, so, so the BRT, so one of the things I'm telling the BRT is business can't be parochial. I was at this thing where I was, uh, I was reading, meeting uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi in India. And right before I was meeting with some of the wealthiest people in, in India, and they were complaining about a bunch of stuff he's doing. He's doing a great job, by the way, honestly. And you may not agree with everything he's doing, but he's, gonna do a, he's doing a great job. And, the, and the, I said, is that what you talked to the, pres the prime minister about? They said, yes, that's what we talked to the prime minister about. I said, I said has it, by these, you took income equality? These people were 10, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars. I said, has it ever occurred to you to go see your prime minister that he's looking at you, you're complaining about the stuff that's running your pocketbook, and he's got 600 million people living in poverty? Uh, maybe we should be thinking about that a little bit and, and helping with that, with good policy. And right. But you've actually said recently, Jamie, that, um, which is very interesting, that you think actually the private sector has a big role to play now, if yeah. not the lead role, in combating not just general problems in society, but combating income inequality. What does that mean? Are you in favor of redistribution? Are you in favor of measures to try and actively intervene to combat income inequality? Yeah. Or how would you at J.P. Morgan try to fight populism? Yeah. So here's another if you one think that income inequality I've, I've is mentioned that, that the FT does. The FT, when they talk about income inequality, you know what they talk about? CEO comp. I mean, if you took the CEO comp of all the top CEOs in America and spread it to everybody, it would make absolutely no difference. Okay? It is not the point. And you're going to have a market where people compete, and maybe some are overpaid and some are underpaid. That's true for baseballers and writers and everybody else like that. That's called freedom and freedom of movement and freedom of people. You can make mistakes like that. Yes, I would make a major push on it. So going back to business, that they can't be parochial. So the BRT is around tax, immigration, infrastructure, smart regulation, education, the things that work. So 
diagnose the problem first. So let's, let's have a have pub, real public policy. Middle wages aren't going up, probably mostly because of low growth and slow growth. We don't know that for a fact, but drive growth. Work skills, we used to be the best in the world at getting kids out of college, community college, and they can both go on to college if they want, uh, uh, vocational schools with a job. So there's a high school across the 59th Street Bridge in New York called the Aviation High School. It's mostly minorities. These kids are traveling two, three hours, an hour to get there. When they graduate high school with a high school degree, they also have a diploma in maintaining small aircraft. They all get a job of $60,000 a year. Okay, it, we used to do that all the time. We don't do it. Our inner city schools are failing. Half the kids in inner city schools you know, don't graduate. The ones who graduate aren't prepared. Again, largely minority. It's a national emergency. There might be an Einstein or you know, someone in that group that we don't know about. And what do we do as a nation? Oh, we'll start a charter school. I mean, it, 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 we have a broken system that's leaving huge swaths behind. So government can't do it. I'm not saying that as an insult. I'm simply saying they don't have the capabilities. It's hard for them to reorganize. It's hard for them to change. It's hard for them to do stuff. But government, business, and I'd add civic society, so it could be universities, Aspen Institute, uh, not-for-profits, local leaders working together. It works. And that's Detroit. It works. Boise, it works. There are all these places it works. There are these places where it doesn't work. We hate each other. It doesn't work. And if you're just pointing fingers, you know, people know when I was just in Seattle, they're talking about when they lost WAMU and they lost the headquarters and the, you know, 8,000 jobs were lost, how terrible it was. Well, why, why didn't they realize how good it was when they had it, as opposed to just when it was gone? And so, yes, I think that we should do it. And work skills is a big part. More growth is a good part. You need a growth agenda, an intelligent growth agenda, competitive type agenda. Competitive business taxes were a big part. So again, I have a different point of view there, everybody else. We needed competitive business taxes. This, and what do we get in the debate? Oh, it was now the right time. Who cares? We should do it in good times and bad times. We need to be competitive. The retention of companies and capital in the United States is critical to the long-term health of the United States. I would have taxed you more on the individual side. I didn't get involved in that. You would have taxed, you want higher taxes? Yeah. On the I would have carried, carried interest. I would have taxed anyone here get carried interest. I would have taxed you on so that. you tax carried interest. You'd raise tax on the wealthy. Income tax? If I had to, I would, yeah. And you know what I tell you all? That if we fix these other problems, including infrastructure, who's the biggest beneficiary? You are. You already own everything. You know? And, and you know, to pay a couple percent more, like state and local taxes, I think they did the right thing to get rid of that deduction. That deduction, just give you, again, facts are really important. Facts are pesky little things, you know? Like, 80% of the benefit went to five states. Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, Illinois, and, and California. 80% of the benefit meant to people making over $500,000 a year. Why the hell should Wisconsin, Mississippi, Arkansas, Pennsylvania be subsidizing those profligate states? They shouldn't. They did the right thing to get rid of it. You know, of course, you know, I told Chuck Schumann, he says, no, we're going to fight to the death on this one. So Chuck, that's great. What about right and wrong for once? And, and so, but, but here's, here's the other thing I would do that I would do that I think is important. I would have a negative income tax. We already have it. So we already have welfare pro for those who don't work and an earned income tax credit for those who work. Okay, the earned income tax credit, I think, is collected by like 30 million people. So if you're a single mother with two children, you get, and you make $7 an hour, which is a little over $14,000 a year, the government gives you $6,000. If you're a single man with no children, the government gives like 400. I would double that. I would make work great again, okay? I would, I, I didn't mean it that way, okay? But I, <laughs> so. But and, hey, it's the, good and the, and the liberal elite, and I, again, listen close to me, the liberal elite, and I grew up in New York City, and I know most of the liberal elite, they are the ones who bad mouth starter jobs. That's a burger flipper job. That's a dead end job. We had a meeting about a, a teller job. Our tellers make $35,000 a year and get medical in New York City. And you know, it was a big meeting like this, and some woman bejeweled gets up and says, that you're, you're, this is great, but it's just a starter job. And a black kid, in the, not a kid, an adult got up in the back and said, ma'am, I'm, I'm a managing director at J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm responsible for hiring 40,000 people a year. I start as a teller. I'm so proud. You know, starter jobs are important. The military teaches them. McDonald's teaches them. Most McDonald's are owned or managed by people who started as a burger flipper. And we diminish it. So I would have an earned income tax credit because, how, because Jobs beget dignity, jobs beget better social outcomes, less drugs, more household formation. Uh, we have to reform some of the welfare benefits. Um, 
and, you, we have to, and there's some problems with it, but that's what we should do. And again, you know what I'd tax, we'd have to feel? I'd tax you. That's what I would do. I'd have, and, and with the economy is doing better, you're going to be far better off if we can get society a little more just and people involved and engaged. When you come out with a speech like that, are you absolutely sure you don't want, for, want to run for president? <laughs> no, I, I, what I, I think, again, I think it's important that we all be involved in the debate, sleeves rolled up, doing the right stuff, and it's, it's not about whether you're going to run for president or not. It's about are you going to get engaged and fight for the right stuff? But let me ask that again. I, I, are you sure way, you don't want I'm, to run for I'm public a patriot. service? I'm a patriot before I'm at CEO J.P. Morgan. So, so, I mean, I, I told my board, Jim Crown's on my board, but I told my board that when I went to see the Chinese officials that, you know, we're applying for a major license there. And what I'm about to say, they may not like very much. But I'm a patriot before. It's, and I told them that too, by the way. I said, look, because some of them tried to put pressure on you about, hey, we're about to give you this thing. I said, I'm not your messenger. You should fix this problem. And if JP Morgan's hurt because you don't, so be it. And that's not exactly what you know, you're supposed to do as a CEO. But I, before I forget, I want to say hi to everyone from my wife. She knows a lot of you in the room. <laughs> She's sorry she can't be here. She would love to have been here. I have, I'm I get about to have my third granddaughter. Uh, so, I mean, I'm waiting for the phone, and at any time, uh, it's August 10th is the due date, so hopefully they'll wait a little bit. Well, that's I a, and I have a fourth granddaughter coming in two months after that. Well, that does sound but like she a was, pretty... She wanted to send her love and her regards to everybody, Paula, Jim, and... That sounds Jillian. like a pretty strong platform to run for public office from. Because I'm surrounded by women. <laughs> Even better. Yeah. Okay, let me ask it this way, then. There aren't many CEOs today who are willing to stick their heads above the parapet. Now, the great thing about interviewing you as a journalist is that you are always outspoken. You say it as you see it. Um, I dare say you regret some of the things you've said over the years, or maybe you don't. Do you regret anything? Yeah, every now and then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the rest of the CEOs, other CEOs, other corporate leaders need to get some spine right now and talk out more openly about the right. need to get involved in combating income inequality or the need to get involved with on the immigration side? Because, you know, we at the FT, we talk to CEO after CEO, and in private, they say strong things. In public, they are surrounded by their team of PR handlers, and we have the most mealy-mouthed quotes you can imagine. You know, I'd like to clone you, but do you think the rest of the well, corporate world landscape in America so needs see, to get a spine? Yeah, they, have to, they have to be prepared to take the shot from the press, who doesn't like CEOs generally talking up, and they're generally hostile to business. Like, how dare you even speak up? You're, you're a CEO. The press is hostile to business? Hugely hostile to business. And, uh, uh, and you've got to read it between the lines a little bit. And, but, but my point is absolutely they should do it. They are doing it. So the BRT uh, has immigration. We want DACA, we want a path to citizenship, we want green cards for the people who go to school, we want the family, um, the family migration issue resolved. Uh, we should have border security, that is a real issue, by the way. I mean, I'm not uh, supporting the wall, but you're gonna have to have border security in, uh, uh, in one form or another. So we, that is a platform. The BRT supports the earned income tax credit. It's in our platform. So if, if people don't really listen to what you say sometimes. When I, my daughter, uh, when I won the pre Trump's council, my daughter sent me an elegant, well thought through, beautiful, kind of nasty letter. <laughs> How could you, Dad? And you know, my two other daughters, my wife sent really short to the point one saying ditto. <laughs> and my daughter, you... my daughter ended with uh, Martin, a quote from Martin Luther King and all that. And I called her up and I'm trying to educate her. I said, because I've read most of Martin Luther King. And this is the President's Business Council that you yeah, were which was on. disbanded, but it was never important. Anyway, um, <laughs> but I said, Julia, le just learn to read history a little bit closer, because Martin Luther King never took himself over the playing field. He, he'd be going to see Trump right now. So the notion that you don't like the man, or you don't like this, you don't like the policy, that you have to take yourself off the playing field, that's a huge mistake. And so, uh, so, and I, and the BRT is the one organization, the chamber does it. I do think organizations have to get involved. And you know what we do now, which has been great? I don't know if we've invited you to one yet. I'm, I'm ready and no, willing. No, we're, we're doing now, and I think everyone should do it. We have the, we call them salon dinners, but around the subject, we invite 10 or 15 press and four or five CEOs to go through in detail trading, in detail bureaucracy slash regulation, in detail uh, immigration. So that you, it's a lot of give and take, but everyone walks out a little bit more educated the issues that the public feels uh, and what's fixable and not fixable. 
Right. I'm going to go to the audience for questions in just a second, because I know it's a deeply engaged, deeply knowledgeable audience, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So start thinking now, but because for, before I do, I want to quickly ask you one other issue, which I'm sure is of great interest to everyone here, which is healthcare. Because you recently stood up and announced that you're part of a trio of companies, um, Amazon, Warren Buffett, working on essentially overhauling the healthcare system. Um, very interesting project. Um, what is actually going to happen on that front? When can we see the results? And I guess what many people in the room would like to know is, can they join in? Yeah. So, so this started because we, we buy, again, here's healthcare. Like, just here's context for the press. Thank you. No. What do you read about every day about healthcare? Is Obamacare. 10 million people have Obamacare exchanges. How many people have healthcare in America? Want to guess? 275 million. We've been arguing about this piece nonstop as if that's the only thing that matters. And we didn't fix any of the healthcare system with Obamacare. I was in favor of trying to do universal healthcare. When Obama actually came to the business roundtable and said, how many of you think we should have some form of universal? And we, literally 75% said it's time to do it. And when we didn't get something that worked, and unfortunately we're spending all this time and stuff. So here's the, and we, so we buy it. We're self-insured, we buy it for all of our employees. We spend a billion and a half dollars a year. I was, every year I go through it, not in the kind of detail I probably should be in, but, you know, real detail, we price it. We fund it much more for lower paid individuals, for higher paid individuals, by the way, so we're a little bit like Robin Hood that way. And we look at wellness programs, and we've gone from enormous, more people doing wellness, saving 50, 100 lives a year, you know, PBMs, drug uses, diseases, how the diseases get help, spouses, how we do these things. We have more nursing centers and, you know, all the things that work. But I always get very aggravated over the fact that it's just, it can't be stopped. So to give you an example, we all put in high deductibles. Almost everyone I know did. And single plans. And the notion that it'll make people shop, give them skin in the game. And absolutely, we've got to get skin in the game. But do people shop? No, because they have no information. So you don't know what a rotator cuff, that hospital, that hospital, the outcomes, or stuff like that, or what the drugs are costing you, or you know, what the alternatives are. So, uh, but here's the list of issues that way beyond that in American healthcare. It's now almost 20% of GDP. Okay, it's almost twice as much as most developing, more than twice as much as most developing nations. We have the best and the worst. So we have some of the best doctors, best medicines, best everything. Some of the worst, you know, 50 or 60 million people unemployed. Uh, we don't have the right wellness programs. We're not controlling obesity. You know, obesity and smoking lead to a huge amount of cancer, drug, depression, stroke, uh, uh, heart disease, et cetera. So wellness programs, we kind of understand, but they're not, we can make it even tougher, but we have to change the laws to do that. End of life is something like 15 to 20% of the cost. It should probably be half of that. Administrative costs are 35%, it should probably, and, and fraud should probably be half of that. We don't keep data. I just got back from China. We went and visited Ping An, a big insurance company there. They have all of your medical data, so, and it's sanctioned by the government. This would be, probably be an issue in America. So if I wanted to get your medical data, your childhood data is with your childhood physician, this data is with this physician. If you had a surgery, here's with that physician. Obamacare actually did something like to try to put these records together, but that data is hugely invaluable for you. What's, what's causing your problem? What this might mean, what the diagnosis might be. So those long, and PBMs. I woke up, woke up and you all read about EpiPen, okay? And it went from $100 in EpiPen to 600. And I just, I just it irritated me. So I, and I started talking to Todd Combs about it, and, and, and I called up our people. I came in. I told my management team about it. You all saw it. They all saw it. I said, but not one of you is asking what I'm about to ask. Why? Who? And what are we paying? And it took me weeks to find out what we pay. Something like $130. We get rebates and discounts, and it sounds like complete bullshit to me. Uh, <laughs> and I started looking at PBMs. Todd Combs started sending me all these research reports and stuff like that. And somehow I, we started to talk to Warren and Jeff. We have, we have dinner every now and then together, and we're all like riled up about healthcare, and we gotta do it better. So we decided so that- So was your idea first, was it? No, we all were just yapping about, we, we should do something. I don't it's remember- It's a great that, story. I don't remember, who said, I don't remember who said, let's form a group. But we kept only three companies, there's a, a, a management instructive here. There is a 43 company healthcare alliance doing the same stuff. Is it gonna work? Who sits on the board? The head of HR. You know, it's not gonna work. You know, and these companies who are selling are really sophisticated. And unlike Jeff and Warren, by the way, a lot of these healthcare guys are my clients. And some were quite pissed off when their stocks fell 5%. And, uh, but I told them, you know, we're just trying to do a better job. That's your job to tell me. So don't get mad at me. Offer your help. And 
Anyway, but long-term control, three people on a handshake. We had hired Atul Gawande, who I know we've been here a couple of times. Big brain and big heart. Yeah, he's, he gave it, he's spoken here at the Institute quite a bit, so. Yeah. We're meeting, I meet with him almost every week now for you know, how we're setting up, getting real estate, getting space, tele telephones, administrative. But eventually, I think it will have big data, legal experts, because I think we gotta change the laws a little bit, uh, uh, medical professionals, and then we're gonna start figuring out what we're gonna attack. So we have a million ideas, but you know, a lot of you know Jeff Bezos would say, and I know his dad is here, uh, he always says, you know, internet, he had big dreams for the internet, but he did books for 15 years, you know, or 10 years. He says, let's get books right. So we're probably gonna figure, let's take this thing. It may be a drug, it may be one chronic care, maybe telemedicine, maybe data, you know, maybe five or six different initiatives, but starting to attack the problem. We don't expect to see anything on this immediately like in a year. It'd be nice if we could say in a year, hey, we found something, we fixed this and share it. We may open this up to other people, you know, but I'm hoping if you, at a minimum, I think it will lead to better outcomes, satisfaction, better ideas for our own employees. At a maximum, maybe it'll help America reform the system. That's a hope and a dream. That's not what we want, but I, I hope it can accomplish that. And we're gonna take the time and effort to, to, to stick with it. Right, well, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room who will be keenly interested and very much wishing you well on that project. But um, I think we should open up to questions now. We have about 20 minutes, so not a lot of time, so please keep your questions or sh comments very short and to the point. Um, please obviously keep them courteous, and it would also be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself. So let's take a question at the back over there. Good afternoon. <coughs> Roger Garentz, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There's much discussion now regarding an inverted yield curve and how that foretells the onset of a recession. Well, I can see some instances where higher short-term interest rates will slow the economy. The level of interest rates now and expect are far from historic terms, far from high in historic terms. So why such a concern with the inverted yield curve now? There, there shouldn't be. I think it's, you know, people, I mean, again, people are very simplistic. Like, well, when the last time that happened, we had a recession. Okay, well, that, that may be true, but you look at the circumstance. The economy is booming, that we've had a suppression of long-term rates. That suppression is reversing now. And you know, the, te the rate should be at 4% today. So there's a very good possibility you can see the short rate go up and the long rate go up. That's also happened before. And also people look at the twos versus tens, they should be looking at the three month versus tens. And so I just, history rhymes, it just doesn't repeat. That is just people saying, well, the last time this happened, that's the inversion. There is a point, so if, I, so if inflation was going up, and even if the, if the bond is at 4% or 5%, and the Fed has to raise rates rapidly, which Paul Volcker raised rates 200 basis points on a Sunday night. Anyone remember that? He didn't say this is going to be nice and easy. He gave you tough medicine. And then, then when they raise rates above a, a real rate, okay, yeah, that's, that is a recessionary thing. That isn't what we're seeing today in the economy, inflation, and all the stuff like that. Yeah, I was saying, I was recently chatting to Ben Bernanke about this, and he made the point, Chairman Bernanke, that he doesn't think an inverted yield curve signals a recession even though it has in the past, but it's an interesting issue. Right. Um, right, we have lots of hands waving here. Let's go there and then there. And then if anyone's on this side's got a question, I'll then move to that side. I'm Bruce McEver with Berkshire Capital. Um, I'm just wondering what your opinion of financial services regulation is and chances of ever getting a single regulator. No, there's no, there's no chance you can, I mean, one of the mistakes we made, again, this is structural, is that we set up like the FSOC, should we have had the group of all these people overseeing the economy, talking, looking around the corner? Of course we should. But we have a group of people who no one controls it. So like mortgage rules are written by seven regulators, okay? Uh, Volcker rules are written by five regulators. We have five interpretations of those rules. And, and mortgage stuff, there are 3,000 servicing requirements. Mortgage rules alone in servicing have reduced mortgage avail availability by trillions of dollars. And they hurt low paid, immigrant, self-employed, not JP Morgan. I've told this many times in the Fed, and we, we have real evidence to prove this, so, but there's no chance you have legislation to change it, and therefore we're stuck with it. Most countries going the other way around, have one regulator, you know, who's got, who, or two, but have, you know, have real authorities, but one regulator, because no one can adjudicate. They're all independent, Do which, you of course they're, which of course they're not. I mean, I, I always tell Geithner and Jack Lou, close the door, throw out the key, and tell them until we finish these mortgage rules, you're not leaving the damn room, that's what the President of the United States wants. And, and, I, and by the way, I think that uh, Steve Mnuchin wants to do that too and is probably much more knowledgeable about the mortgage issues than anybody else because he was in it. 
Do you think Steve Mnuchin is being prevented from creating more intelligent financial regulation? No, he's actually rolled out four reports, Treasury reports, very detailed about all of these rules, where they're not coordinated, whether they should be relooked at, recalibrated, what effect they had on small business lending, uh, a lower middle income lending, credit card lending, payday lending, uh, shadow banking, it, and very well done, thoughtful stuff. And what, what do you get done regulatory wise? I don't know. But then they've just got the regulators in place. So I think some of the rules will change over time. But it'll just be constant recalibration. You're not going right. to see a massive rewrite of Dodd Frank. We have a question um, there and then over there. <clears throat> Jamie Shelley Friedstein, Aspen. What risks do you, can you assess to the lack of liquidity in the fixed income and equity markets as a result of the regulatory environment in the banks if we were to get into a somewhat difficult situation? Yeah, so the risk- Are the, the markets gonna seize up? Yeah, the, the real risk, and again, the, we had some seizing up, remember in February and a couple of times and certain securities got collapsed and stuff like that. And, uh, but of course, you know, in some ways people say, oh, it's great, look, we've had these problems and there was no problem, therefore it's not a big deal. I tell the regulators, you need to test that kind of stuff when times are tough, not when times are good. It will cause an issue. And I don't know the full extent. So again, I like to look at bookends, one issue is that just less liquidity, less stuff. Uh, it takes people longer to get out of positions. People are a little more cautious with what they buy. You create, a lot of people create their own liquidity now by keeping more cash effectively or being a little more cautious. They run their own portfolios. I'm not sure that's great for the economy, but that's what they're doing. But there is this one that if all these things hit in a bad way, that you can't sell security, stocks are down 10 or 20 percent, uh, that people start to panic. People liquidate things. ETFs don't work exactly the way some people expect them to work. Yeah, that could cause market panic. It won't just be because of market making. It'll be because the effects of reversing QE, higher inflation, different monetary transmission monetary policy, and regu regulatory requirements like LCR and Volcker. And that mix of stuff, can, there's a chance it can be toxic. But again, I look at possibilities and probabilities. I'm not predicting that. JP Morgan will be fine. The American economy, <laughs> the American economy may, may not be. I'd expect nothing less. <laughs> Diamond, I'm Scott Quartz from Aspen. And we're in a bull market now that's run 3,400 days. We're up well over 300% in a world where the average bull market post-World War II is 1,800 days and 161%. Uh, we're wondering if this bull market is in the ninth inning, if it's been juiced by the tax deal. And my other concern is the average weight of defensive stocks in portfolios all over the country right now is only 10 to 15 percent. Is that a concern? Yeah, so again, I'm going to kind of give you bookends in this to, uh, to think about it. If we, ha we may, it's 10 years, nine years is recovery, and that's the same question for the length of the bull market. The bull market probably goes until right before the economy starts to turn, generally. And, and <laughs> the economy, what I just told you before, is that the economy is doing quite well. So it can actually go for two or three more years. You know, there's no law that says that to stop now. There's, and now, of course, we may shoot ourselves in the foot, but if it goes for two or three more years, companies make profit at the margin. If we have two and a half or 3% growth, corporate profits will be up five, six, seven, eight, 10%. That fully justifies PEs today and credit spreads, even if uh, multiples come down. You know, you, you one growth, you know, you're growing into the other over time. You know, if you postulate we're gonna have a recession tomorrow, no, stocks are 30, 40% overvalued. And so I just don't know, because I don't know what the exact truth of that is. And, uh, but I, I think there's a better chance you can have runway of growth and stuff like that. Uh, but I totally agree with you, by the way, on the, the valuations, the distortions because of ETFs and passives and how people look at stocks. Remember, the public speculates. You know, when we had the IPO boom in the 2000, and they were excoriating thing about the disclosures and IPO documents, disclosures, banking, conflict, banking, conflict. What one of you ever read a freaking prospectus? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being quite serious. Let's get in. You heard it's a good thing. It's going to run for a while. It's the same thing in home prices, the same thing in China's stock market, the same thing. And that happens. People don't pay attention to stuff. They pay attention to, you know, these guys are going to go to the moon, two trillion. And, and so I do agree that's a little bit of an issue. People can get hurt. It's life. It's, that's normal okay. market. <laughs> I can see a lot of hands waving, but I'd like to just be interventionist for a moment and say we have some super smart women in the audience. Um, I'd like to make the next question from a woman, please, because it actually... Okay, over there. Fantastic. Thank you. 
Judy Allen from Houston, Texas. Yes, Judy. Could you speak to us about what the banking industry needs to worry about in terms of our accounts being hacked or interfered with? And my second question is, can you speak to us about the long-term future of cryptocurrencies? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so the, the Do you believe in Bitcoin yet? So the, the uh, hacking and stuff like that, I, I, I put down as a risk, the government knows about it, is cyber. It is probably the biggest risk facing the nation today across banking, electrical grids, aircraft. We are unprotected. Banks and defense companies are quite good at it. We spend $700 million a year. Everything that we are tracking, everything, we know what our employees do every day. We know they upload, they download. We've got tripwires and kill switches. Every time you send money as a corporation or a credit card, it goes through hundreds of algorithms to make sure it's not fraud. The thing that happened to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York never happened to us. So we do your company, your, even your company payments go through multiple tests, time of day, who used it, where it went, why it went, even how you use the computer sometimes. It's just a test to make sure these aren't frozen transactions. So you are very safe, but a massive cyber attack, either nation state or criminal, uh, it, it's a big deal. And so while, while I think we're very, very protected, I think that those, that is a big deal. And so, um, uh, and we do, that's the one area, I call it, we were a police state. We don't take prisoners. I don't care who complains about it. We're going to put rules in place about how we're going to function inside the company. Uh, we probably went to all the uh, cloud providers and gave them much more, and we do it a little bit now, but much more stringent rules. Third-party oversight, who you're attached to, how it goes. When you, if you do business with us, I'm, I'm sure some of you do, we've tortured you. We know a lot more about your cyber risk, your stuff like that, than you probably knew about your own. And so, because we can't have you hooked into our systems if you present a certain type of risk to us. And we do the same thing in privacy and all these other things. How many risks do you, ha how many, sorry, how many attacks, how many cyber attacks do you face each day? Oh, it's hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands each day. Because yeah. I remember we talked about this before and I was stunned by that figure and I actually didn't believe it. And I went back and checked with, so you at JP Morgan alone are facing hundreds of thousands of cyber attacks every yeah. single day. Some are minor, but yeah. The, the, what, I, what you should worry about isn't attacking Jay Moore, is that they're going to go after the weak spots in the system. And think of the weak spots. I mean, I, we've tried to do third-party oversight in the Federal Reserve. They won't let us. I think it's a little, maybe a weak spot. I think government systems are a weak spot. The IRS has been raided many times. It, clearing exchanges, clearing houses. You know, we torture them and all this stuff. So there are these weak spots. And uh, by so we have but to, do you think but, the Fed is question about regulation? You know what the biggest risk is to regulation? The resources going into stupid stuff that should be going to cyber, privacy, AI. And, and you know, we got 8,000 people redocumenting forms from five years ago because you know, the regulators say we didn't cross the T and dot the I. We spent billions of dollars doing KY, well, I'm sure we've tortured a lot of you in KYC, AML, BSA. We haven't found one bad guy. <laughs> billions of dollars. Bi billions. And of course, it's, and it's board time, it's, it's, it's computer time, it's regulatory time, it's brain time, it's the whole thing. And we, this is the one we should be worried about. So blockchain is real. Okay, because it's a technology. It's not that complicated. It's a technology. It's, it's, it's a ledger of data. You have to agree what the data is, how it's encrypted, who can use it, how it's permission, all stuff like that. We use it for a bunch of stuff already, but it has to be use case. So you have to write the code, and it can't be used for certain things. So it could be used for, if we trade loans at the end of the day and settle it, all the data that custodies need and the buyer, the seller, the tax officials need, it could all be in that updated. We all trust it. But like FX trade and equity trade, we do thousands of trades in a split second. You can't update these files in a split second. So it, it won't be good for certain things, and it costs money. So we do equity trade, it you know, costs very little. It would add 10 or 20 cents to trade, just to update the blockchain for everyone else's blockchains and stuff like that. So cryptocurrency is a scam. I mean, you said before okay, that and you said before you, you would fire anybody in J.P. Morgan, who was dealing in Bitcoin because that was dumb I and I, dangerous. I, I didn't. I, I, this I, I regret saying. I don't want to make myself a poster, poster boy against Bitcoin. So I don't really care. You got to do whatever you want. I have no interest in Bitcoin. But of course, the second I said it, you know, the underground. I mean, <laughs> they have like death threats. I mean, he's against. And of course, the big. You banks, had death threats over Bitcoin. No, I'm saying. I'm, well, on the internet, you get. You know, they check the web and stuff like that. Just the hostility and anger and. And they're just, the, the banks took it down. They want to defend this. They want to defend the system as the best way to fix it. Here, this is the, the fraud, OK? There's, there's gold. All the gold in the room would fit in a tent, probably 10 times the size of this. It's not replicatable. What would gold be worth that was replicatable? 
Nothing. Like sand. If it were something. So it's not like gold, because Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin 2, Litecoin, Changecoin, it gets replicated. So you can say Bitcoin maintained that value, but there's only one of them out there now. And they all have different purposes, stuff like that. Fiat currency. I've heard this statement. It's a matter of trust. No different than Bitcoin. You trust Bitcoin. You trust the encryption. Fiat currency is not simply a matter of trust. It is the legal tender of the land. You have to accept it at par. Okay? It is defended by the courts, the law, the police, and the military. Okay? The central bank is supposed to defend it. They can debase it. Of course they can. But the job is not to. The job is to make sure it has value down the road. The U.S. dollar means something. And on the other side of a U.S. dollar, what is there? Look at the, what's the bank, what's the, the bank, the balance sheet of the Central Reserve, the Federal Reserve Bank, okay, is $4 trillion, a trillion dollars is currency, okay, and on the other side of the balance sheet, what are the assets? They're obligations of the United States government. That asset is supported by the full faith of the taxing power and the military of the United States government of America. So the notion is the same thing. Finally, the bigger it gets, the more government's going to close it down. They don't like big things. They don't like things they can't control. They're already doing it in Korea, Japan, and China. Uh, they're going to they're get scared here. A little old lady's going to lose money. And then the terrorism, it's already been used a little bit for terrorism. So, and how do you stop it? Well, if I said to you, I'm from the DOJ, if you buy yourself Bitcoin, aid and bet to buy and sell Bitcoin, you're going to go to jail. That's how you stop it. It'll still exist because it's all over the world. It'll still be used for, for what I'm going to say are good use cases. Not legitimate, good. Criminals, tax avoiders, cross-border transactions, crooks. And by the way, if you were in Venezuela, Cuba, or a bunch of other countries, you're probably better off having Bitcoin than the currency. <laughs> so so it, may, it won't go away, but you know, to say it's the same thing as the US dollar is virtually insane. Wow. Well. We are very, very sadly, we could frankly carry on talking all day, very sadly out of time. I have two things to say. Um, firstly, that if you ever decided you would like a member of the great unwashed press along on your bus tours as a fly on the wall to see what's happening. Well, we, had Wilf, we did CNBC from the bus tour. Oh, well, the and FT should be there too. I would volunteer any time. I'd love to see your bus tours. a little bit below you guys, I think. Well, hey, you We're could wave your standards and you could have the FT okay. along, but I think it'd be okay. fascinating to see your bus tour. Okay, we, I'd, um, I'd be happy to buy you one, yeah. All right. Well, as a listening tour, it's fascinating, but I guess the more important point is this. Um, you may not be willing to go into public service yet, although I think the question is certainly there about your longer-term future, but I think on behalf of everyone in the room, we can certainly say a heartfelt thanks for the way that from the private sector, you've used your position to advance not just the interests of J.P. Morgan, but a wider debate about the responsibility of the corporate sector and civil society to work together to try and solve many of the other intractable problems in America. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.